Well, greetings, test takers. This is Dean Tenney coming to you from my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas with a, another explication of an SIE practice exam. Can't have too many practice exams in your execution of your study plan. Uh, shout out to Kaplan. If you don't have a Kaplan QBank, I highly recommend it as a paid supplement. If you already have it, uh, kudos on a good choice and uh, kudos to Kaplan for giving you that little curtain commercial and telling you that you can get 10% off at checkout with my discount code GURU10. They allow you to get a free look at uh, Kaplan content. The best free supplement to your paid study materials is the YouTube channel, my YouTube channel. All right, so let's get started on this uh, exam. Your client, Janice Thomas, is an active trader and wants to invest in a managed equity portfolio. So the minute we see managed equity portfolio, we can get rid of choice B because ETFs are passive and we can get rid of choice uh, D because there is no portfolio. It's a dead instrument. Uh, P.S. Uh, I forgot to say you should hit uh, pause, uh, attempt your answer. And then when you've got your answer, hit play and then see, you know, if you agree with Dean, doesn't mean I'm right. You know, I'll probably miss a couple along the way as well. We'll see at the end, but at least you can, you know, uh, explication means I'm just not going to read the question, give you the answer. We're going to talk about it is the point. All right. So one of the things you have to be able to do on your test is contrast an open-end mutual fund, which is continually offering new shares to the public with a closed-end fund that trades supply and demand in the secondary market. And that is a closed-end fund. And that is indeed very testable on your exam. All the following may be purchased in the secondary market, except you're definitely going to get questions to make you distinguish between the primary market where the issuer receives the proceeds. That's a primary transaction. All those together is the primary market and the secondary market where the previous owner receives the proceeds. Those are secondary transactions. All of them together are called the secondary market. So you can certainly buy a common stock in the secondary market. You can certainly buy a REIT in the secondary market. No, open-end funds, you're doing business uh, directly with the mutual fund itself. You know, a open-end mutual fund, common shares you buy in open-end fund are new shares created just for you. You know, it's the NAV plus the sales charge and you pay the public offering price. Uh, by the way, the other implication of that is that, you know, you're not actually selling your shares in the secondary market in an open-end mutual fund, you're redeeming your shares. A convertible feature prefer preferred shares. So, Conversion, convertible features allow you to switch your status from being a preferred stockholder into becoming a stock, common stockholder. And we have convertible preferreds and we have convertible uh, bonds. And, uh, you know, the conversion price is based on par. Par in a preferred stock is 100. Par in a bond is 1,000. I don't think on your SIE they'll do anything more than make you come up with a conversion ratio. And even that would be low probability. Uh, but that would be based on par. You take par, divide by the conversion price to get the ratio. Now, if you're moving on to a seven, then you're going to have to have a lot more depth you know, on understanding, like how to calculate parity, all kinds of things. Anyways, a convertible feature of preferred shares allows the owner to exchange shares for bonds. No, 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 no. The preferred share is some other issue. No. For a fixed number of shares of the issuer's common stock. There we go. Allows you to switch your status. Uh, which of the following records must be kept by a broker dealer for six years? The vast majority of brokerage firm records are three years, but there's very few that are lifetime and six. And so customer new account forms are certainly a six year record. It makes sense because arbitration is six years. So one for sure. Uh, advertising the firm is published. That's a three year record. Uh, stock records, the stock that's come into the broker dealer and stocks that go out of the broker dealer, uh, that is certainly a six year record. And minutes of the books is a, a lifetime record. And so it's one in three. Uh, I don't think you need to know anything other than on your SIE, the vast majority of brokerage firms or records are three, customer complaints are four, money laundering is five. So that's what I would know if I were an SIE candidate like yourself. An investor owns a bond purchased uh, several years ago, yielding 3%, which at the time was considered a fair return. However, these fixed 3% interest payments have not been kept up with inflation. So basically, you were getting 3% on your $1,000, 
or you know based on bar so that was thirty dollars you were getting and you're getting in two semi-annual installment and now they're saying that thirty dollars doesn't buy you as many products and services as it did yeah uh, i'm coming from las vegas and maybe you got 30 bucks can get me an upscale casual at dinner and uh next time i go in there it's uh 35 bucks or 40 bucks and now my bond no longer pays for that so this isn't financial risk this isn't currency risk for it to be currency risk there would have to be something the question about some foreign entity uh purchasing power risk there we go ding 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 inflation is too much money uh, chasing too few goods right and uh, you know you definitely should have a handle on that in terms of economics right so too much money chasing too few goods is inflation and too many goods and not enough money is deflation. And you should know the Federal Reserve Board is in charge of price stability or price equilibrium. And you should know the tools of the Fed. Uh, basically what happens when the Fed buys and sells government securities. Uh, which of the following would not require uh, delivery of notice? You know, I just uh, recently put out a uh, video tips tricks and memory aids for the SIE. And I think I would use it in this question. I call it the trick. I call it the Sesame Street trick. One of these things is not like the other. So if we're not going to notify the stock or bond holders, uh, you know, we're thinking, what is this in the normal course of business? So two for one stock split, I certainly have to let you know about that. A rights offering. Absolutely. Your rights offering is your uh, is what the issuer does to give you the first right of refusal on the issuance of new shares because you have the you know a right to maintain your proportion ownership. We certainly have to tell you about that. The corporation uh, payment of a cash dividend. You should have been struggling with that because you should have known there's a declared date. That's how that process is going with, with the declared date. Uh, no, paying our bonds. No, we don't. You know, we just pay you. We either pay you or you don't. So uh, D, kind of a funky one. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about about that particular question. A licensed person, this is one of my pet peeves. I wish instead of saying licensed persons or you're getting a license, I wish instead we would say registration. It just drives me nuts that people you refer to things as a license. You know, I had a client one time and he said, you know, let me see a copy of your stockbroker's license. And I, I could get why he might think there is such a thing, but there really isn't, right? So what you have is a CRD number uh, after you take your six or your seven top off. Anyways, you leave the industry for full-time military service. This is the least we can do for you. So what we're going to do is put your uh, registration into a special inactive status, right? And then when you come back, you tell us whether you have an epiphany and you want to stay on active duty or the securities industry doesn't speak to you anymore. And after 90 days, it goes into a normal kind of a process of perhaps a, a U5 or, uh, you know, putting you back on, on the roles of the broker dealer. So the answer is B. Uh, I would have a general understanding on your SIE about U4s and U5s and the special and active stuff. It's uh, not enough to make or break you, but it's, it's certainly there. To receive the uh, dividend. So you should definitely know there's a declared date, there's an X date, there's a record date, and there's a payable date. And you should definitely know that the X date is the first date. There are others on which the stock no longer trades with the dividend attached. Right. And you should know that it's going to go down, uh, you know, by the amount of that. So this says you have to appear on this transfer agent. Now, this is a Kaplan being uh, kind of a jerk, but that's synonymous with saying a shareholder as of record. So a shareholder as of record. Now, a different question to become a shareholder as of record on the record date, you would have to buy the stock the day before the X. But that's not what this question is. So again, I highly recommend, no surprise, my video, Tips, Tricks, and Memory Aids. And one of those is to make sure RTFQ, you read the full question. I can't tell you, even I'm guilty of this, where I'll think I've answered the question. And what I've actually done is answered the question I thought I was there, rather than the question that was actually there. So uh, by the way, you should know the X date. D isn't the answer, but you should definitely know the X date is the first date on which the stock no longer trades with the dividend attached. And you should definitely know that that's the day before uh, the record date. I, I try and keep the screen as big as possible. And one of the reasons I'm actually, let's see if I can make it even bigger. It looks like I can. Um, the, I'm doing another Kaplan explication here because the last one I did, I didn't realize people are using mobile phones and 
they're not on 27 inch screens in a studio like I am. So I try to make as big as I can. The other thing I know is a lot of people use uh, the channel and audio. So I'm trying to do a better job at reading the question and the answer choices in case you're, you're listening and you're not following along. Anyways, record date is the answer to that one. Uh, which of the following is considered a systematic risk, risk in the system? You know, there is a tendency of securities prices to move together. So non-systematic risk can be diversified. You can mitigate it through diversification. And the easiest for, way for most people to diversify is in the context of a uh, mutual fund. Now, systematic risk is the tendency of securities prices to move together. And so regardless of the fixed income investment vehicle you have, systematic risk, systemic risk, risks in the system, I don't care what you have right now. I'm coming to you in an inflationary environment of 8% plus. And anything in your portfolio that is fixed income and oriented is exposed to purchasing power risk. Default risk would be unique to a particular issuer. Financial risk would be associated with a particular category of investments. Uh, regulatory risk, again, you could avoid default risk, financial risk, and regulatory risk through diversification. Purchasing power risk, you cannot avoid through diversification to mitigate that. So the best answer in this answer set is A. Uh, Michaela is a big fan of Seabird Coffee and is an enthusiastic investor. She currently owns 1,000 shares of the company's stock and 10 contracts on the stock as well. Now, it's important. Options are like learning a foreign language. So when you own a call contract, what you have is the choice to buy the stock at the strike price. And each one of those contracts gives Michaela a choice to buy a uh, hundred shares. She's got 10 of them. So she already has a thousand shares and she has the opportunity to buy another thousand shares. Wow. Uh, what is her maximum gain uh, for this position? And uh, she's gonna have unlimited gain on the stock and on the option position. Now, again, be careful. If this was a covered call, if she had written those 10 call contracts, she would have limited gain because she'd have to give up the stock at the strike. But it doesn't say she you know, short the calls. It says she actually owns the call contract. Now, in your SIE, you're going to have three or four option questions. And I'm not so sure how much work you want to do for those three or four. And most of them are recognition, like when do options expire? What kind of orders do you use uh, to do things, you know? Uh, so I'm not sure how much of that you actually want to do, uh, but, you know, it, it is what it is. It will pay you dividends on your your stock. I have a lecture. I highly recommend it. No surprise on intro to stocks. It's two hours or options, two hours, and you should check it out. If a registered rep terminates employment with a member firm, how many years may elapse for, for she would again be required to affiliate with a with in order to affiliate with a prior firm, if a registered terminates employment with a member firm, how many years may elapse before she would be required to pass qualifying? Well, by the way, I'm just reading it again because it's kind of funky. It doesn't matter whether she's coming back to her firm or she's going to a new firm. It doesn't matter. You know, when you leave, we file a U5 on you, and that disassociates you from the brokerage firm. So not bueno if somebody starts talking about a U5. U4 is hello. U5 is goodbye. And that's two years. After two years, uh, you would have to come back in and uh, retest, requalify. Which of the following statements best describes financial risk? So uh, a risk generally caused by poor management in operating decisions. Now, what we're looking for here is something that would be unique or as close to unique to financial risk as possible, uh, given the answer set. So given this answer set, and, you know, financial risk is mostly associated with, you know, financial instruments. So let's see. The risk that when interest rates decline, it's difficult to invest proceeds from redemptions. Yeah, that, that's kind of nonsensical. The risk of security with a call feature might be called before maturity. You know, that's interest rate risk, declining interest rate. The risk that the issuer will be unable to meet. Yeah, they default. So uh, D, financial risk. I would prefer we were told that's credit risk, but, you know, oh, well. Given the answer set, that is the uh, best answer. An investor asks for a copy of the mutual fund statement of additional information. So we don't put everything in the uh, prospectus because, my God, if we did, it would be another 100 pages long. 
So what we do instead is tell you that there is a statement of additional uh, information that is available upon request. And so you say, hey, Dean, I'd like to see that. You know, for example, might have like brokerage costs, you know, what are our transaction costs, uh, buying and selling other thing. And uh, that we have to do so within three days free of charge. And again, I don't think that's something you need to worry about on your SIE. Uh, I don't think that's high risk. Six days into the cooling off period. So you should definitely know that when a issuer wants to sell securities to the public and they make an S1, not testable S1, but a registration statement, they earn into a cooling off period, which is a minimum of 20 days. And you should know that during that cooling off period, what I'm allowed to do is send you a preliminary prospectus, also known as a red herring, that has pretty much everything you need to make an informed decision except the final offering price. You should know those indications of interest that I do collect are non-binding in all parties, and we are allowed to place a tombstone. So it says once the issuer submits these, so six days into the cooling period. Now, deficiency letter is the SEC asking for additional information. They think your registration statement uh, is deficient in some fashion, and they would like some more information, and you say, aye, aye. That's the naval term for, I hear you, Captain, and I will obey. But once the uh, issuer submits these, and assuming they satisfy the deficiency, the cooling off period will resume. So until we get you know get handled with the SEC, what they want to see, we're kind of in this uh, status of, you know, trying to make sure we're we're making good. Now I've seen sometimes I've seen people who get so many letter deficiency letters they just give up and they don't make it through the process, which is kind of embarrassing. Now this is a roundabout way to test you on do you know it's twenty days? I don't think they'll try and trick you on your SIE. But if we're six days in and we resume the cooling off period, that would be, you know, 14, right? So I think on the test, it'll just be straightforward to know it's 20 days. A married couple opens a new account with a broker, dealer, and tenants in common. This is very testable. So you should be able on your SIE to contrast joint tenants with rights or survivorship with tenants in common. You know, customer accounts are very testable. You should know what an UPMA account is. You should know what... Uh, a 529 plan is. So that definitely is worthy of you spending some uh, study time as an SIE candidate. Um, in explaining the details of the account to the couple, the registered rep would not indicate which of the following. Orders made by given by either party would not indicate. So they're asking me, what am I going to not say? <laughs> right. So uh, that's true. So I'm looking for something I'm not going to say. And the event of the death, the decedent's interest, the account goes to the decedent's estate, that is very testable. That is extremely testable. You might want to make a flashcard, you know, put it in your notes. I hope uh, people use paper and pencil or pen or whatever while they're listening. These are four by six cards. And on stuff like this, if you're listening, maybe you can make some flashcards. Uh, mail be sent to either party with the permission of the other party. Uh, yeah, it sounds like the thing I'm not going to say is that security is going to be registered in the name of either party. No, both. However the account reads, that's how certificates are going to be titled. That's how checks are going to be cut. Now, I don't particularly like this question, except as a reminder that you need to know B is in boy is definitely true. You need to know there's a fractional interest. It could be 50-50, 80-20, 70-30. And that idea of what happens when they die. Be able to contrast that with joint tenants with rights or survivorship. A common stock's shareholder's residual right. Residual. That means if anything's left. You know, so if we liquidate the corporations, very testable to know where securities are in the liquidation. The most senior security in liquidation would be the secured bondholders, very testable. Then the unsecured bondholders, then the preferred stock, and the common stock. And what we're saying here is if there's anything left after we've taken care of the secured bonds, the unsecured bonds, the preferred stock, shareholders are going to get that. So that's your residual right. All right. So during the dissolution of corporate assets, again, that's what that means in English, liquidation, common stockholders will be paid for first before debt holders and preferred shareholders. That, boy, that is a really bad miss. You only you know, get one point off for missing a question, but if you miss that one, I think I would take more than one point from you. Uh, during the dissolution of corporate assets, common shareholders will be paid if any funds are left after the preferred shareholders are paid, but before the debt holders are paid. No, the debt holders come first. Uh, during the dissolution of corporate assets, common shareholders will be paid if any funds are left after the debt holders are paid, but before the preferred. Now, on the, on the test, as I told you, this will be more straightforward 
senior to junior or junior to senior, but, you know, kind of a word salad here. Uh, D, during the dissolution of corporate assets, common shareholders will be paid if there are any funds left after the debt holders and portfolios. Yeah, you're last, last in line. So uh, I don't, D is and dog. Um, I don't know if it's helpful. The way I think of it is as owner of the business, I have the first claim on profits, but the last claim in liquidation, if that's helpful. And then the theoretical, uh, theoretical liquidation value is represented as a balance sheet calculation we could do called book value, right? Toys R Us recently filed chapter seven bankruptcy liquidation. And so in that liquidation of Toys R Us, it was the secured bondholders got paid first then the unsecured bondholders, then the preferred stockholders. And unfortunately, there was no residual claim. So, you know, the shareholders got wiped out. Uh, which of the, each of the following is likely benefits of owning shares of common stock except, yeah, you get to vote. You know, the corporate charter will stipulate whether it's cumulative voting or statutory voting. You shouldn't be struggling with that. Uh, dividend payments, you have the right to a dividend payment if declared by the board of directors. And if it's paying a dividend, typically that would be something quarterly and that would be associated with a mature, stable corporation that's generating, you know, more earnings than they need to run the business. Uh, limited liability. Yeah. You, you know, nobody's going to call you and say your stock is negative five. You should definitely know that interest payments uh, are for bondholders, not stockholders. Uh, by the way, that test taking trick, one of the test taking tricks is things that are different, right? So dividends and interest are entirely different things. And this question is about common stock. Uh, two months ago, your customers sold short 200 shares at 15. So when you sell short, you're selling borrowed securities. You know, in most businesses, you sell things you don't own. It's called fraud. But in our business, that's called selling short. You probably heard that saying, don't sell that person short. And so when you sell short, what you're hoping is to sell high and buy low. Now, the problem is if you're wrong, by the way, all short sales must be conducted in a margin account. So whether you want to borrow money or borrow securities, you need a margin account. The only exception to that would be if you want to sell short a call on a stock you own. But other than that, you need a margin account. So I call you, I say, yeah, we were able to locate 200 shares of Seabird. We sell it short. So you're going to get three grand from selling the stock you don't own. Today, the stock is trading at 10. That's a good, good deal. So in order to close out the position. So again, this is very testable. I did an opening sale. An opening sale is used to establish or uh, add to a short position. And so now what I'm going to do is a closing purchase. So what I'm going to do is go buy back the 200 shares at 10 and give it back to the person I borrowed it from. So A, uh, I am no, borrow was, was the opening transaction. So A, a. Uh, B would have been a good hedge. They're not asking about a hedge. You know, it would be smart if you're short the stock to buy some calls or in or buy stop. Question isn't about that. I uh, realize a $5 loss. No, 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 no. You know, you, you got a gain. Yeah, you buy 200 shares of Seabird and you give it back to the person you borrowed it from. Uh, that's going to cost you two grand. And remember, you got three grand when you did it. So you made $1,000 or $5 a share on 200 shares by selling it high at 15 and buying it back low at uh, 10. Your customer purchased a big co common stock for $45 a share. After holding the position for a time, you know, I don't like that for a time because it was really important if I'm at risk for more than 12 months, that would be a long-term capital gain and less than that short-term. And so it obviously isn't about taxes because if it is, they would have to tell me what is that period of joy. So I sold it for 35. It looks like I got a five a $10 loss, right? Uh, I bought it for 45. I sold it for 35. Looks like a $10 loss. Uh, by the way, just don't get hung up on the fancy language. The fancy language for that 45 is that's my cost basis. Cost basis simply means, you know, when you turn the money into an investment. A 70-year-old customer has a 30,000 uh, RMD, required minimum distribution. So thank you very much. Maybe you didn't know that, but you should. There are required minimum distributions on retirement accounts when you turn 72. The testable exception is a Roth. If it's in the 20% tax bracket and they only withdraw $25,000. So the, the penalty for not making your withdrawal is a pretty, uh, pretty hefty, you know, so that's what they're getting at. Now I wouldn't worry. I'd fly high on this stuff. I don't think this is high probability on your exam, uh, but uh, you know, 
you know, I would just know 10%. If you get it before you're 59 and a half, 72 rollovers are 60 days, you know, stay focused on the big picture. But anyways, uh, you're supposed to take, uh, been taken 30 because it's based on the actual, you know, life expectancy and they tell you it's 30. And so you only took 25. So that means you're going to have $5,000 that you're exposed to that 50% penalty, which is $2,500. The IRS is going to force that distribution uh, on you, that shortfall. So uh, then you're going to have ordinary income on the amount you withdrew. So that's 20% of the 30. So that's 6,000. So 6,000 plus the penalty is uh, 8,500. Again, I don't think you're going to see that on your actual exam. Uh, which of the following is not a type of real estate uh, direct participation program? So, you know, we form a partnership. I'll be the general partner and you listeners can be the limited partners. You provide the money. I provide the experience. And we go out and do some uh, new construction. That certainly would be a type of direct participation program, also known as a partnership. I wouldn't overdose on this. If you get partnership questions, maybe one or two, and I would definitely know what I just told you. There's going to be a general partner and there's going to be limited partners. Uh, I would definitely you know, have a general understanding of that. I would know there's going to be a flow through of the income and the losses. I would uh, definitely know uh, that you have... Uh, uh, no liquidity because as the general partner, you can't get in or out of the direct participation program partnership without my permission. Uh, we buy existing properties. Certainly we can form a partnership, go buy existing apartment buildings, for example. Uh, we can form a partnership and go buy some raw land outside the metropolitan area here of Las Vegas, where I'm coming to you from. Uh, no, income is associated with oil and gas deal. So uh, the answer is D. If you tell you miss your SIE because of partnerships, I'm going to say, you know, I don't believe you. There's got to be something else that you missed, right? Uh, communicating the information on the firm's business continuity plan. So all broker-dealers uh, have to have a business continuity plan about what they're going to do to maintain operations if there's a, you know, natural disaster, act of God, you know, something like that. Anyways, um, a terrorist attack. Uh, when requested, so they're asking what's not true. And what is true, so in my test taking tips, tricks, and memory aids, I said the one thing you might want to do on these questions is maybe put a T or an F next to it, right? So when requested, true. Ongoing on the firm's website, true. So you can do this on your scratch paper, T. Now, even if I only get the first two as T's, I'm looking for the false, I have a 50-50. Annually, no. At account opening, yeah. I don't think you need to know it's be up, be careful. You don't want to study negative information. So the takeaway is not that the, you know, you should know it's not annually. You know, one thing you might want to consider doing is what I call poor man's flashcards. And so here's a, an example of a poor man's flashcard on this kind of a question. You get rid of the accept, you get rid of the annually, and now you have what you need to know if you're making a flashcard or taking notes. So what you want to make sure you're taking away from these accept questions is the truthful information and not the untruthful information. Okay, well, I set my timer when I'm doing these explications because they are typically longer. Listen, welcome to my channel. I do longer form narrative content. And, you know, when I started the channel coming up on two years almost, people say, oh, you know, people don't like that. You know, nobody's going to be interested in something that's longer than 15 minutes. And that is proven not to be true. And when people were telling me that, I said, well, listen, there's a pause button. <laughs> so... We've been at about 30 minutes. Most people are assist wired for about 30, 45 minutes of sustained concentration. So what I would suggest you do is uh, set up your study blocks accordingly. The idea that you're going to study for eight hours is ridiculous. Set up three, four study blocks at 45 minutes and do some questions like we're doing now. Hit pause, take a break, come back, change the channel intellectually, do something different, do some reading, do some practice questions. Uh, but we've been at it 30 minutes. All right, our next one. What type of account fee is structure is typically better for the moderate to active investor? You know, um, you, you know, the test does kind of make this prejudicial thing that passive investors are going to incur lower costs as costs, you know, people who buy and hold their securities versus, you know, people who are you know doing more trades because they're going to incur more costs. That's just kind of a, a thing on the test. And the idea is, 
uh, a fee-based account would be more attractive to somebody who's doing more trades than somebody who isn't. Uh, you know, the, the difference here would not be broad-based or narrow-based. Uh, there we go, commission-based. It's going to be the choice between B and D. And then the opposite of this would be true. Typically better for the inactive or passive trader. They'd be better off perhaps to pay for the transactions rather than the fee. During the course of a day, a customer makes six separate cash deposits. That's kind of weird. You know, that sounds suspicious to me. I mean, you, you I see you six times, right? Or you, 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 you six separate cash, at six different branches. That's even weirder, right? Totaling over $11,000. Uh, this would be an example of, well, actually, this is called uh, structuring. And it's, uh, you know, commercially illogical. And so it's not the CTR. The CTR would be not for suspicious activity. That would be for any transaction, you know, 10, uh, over 10, right? So it's going to be the suspicious activity report. Uh, de but definitely make sure you are, have a handle on anti-money laundering. I don't think they'll get into this idea of structuring, but you certainly know the Bank Secrecy Act is what gives the broker-dealer permission to share with FinCEN your you know, CTRs, currency transaction reports, and SARS. And I would definitely know those are five-year records. I would definitely know we have to have an AML officer. You know, uh, make sure you got all that stuff down. Uh, we have to conduct an AML test annually. So again, that's another target-rich area for you on the SIE. I have a separate lecture on money laundering. It's about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, let me know what your thoughts are in the comments. I've been thinking about linking the, you know, I timestamp the stuff, which is, you know, a lot of work. I'm whining, but. You know, and I tell you like question 24 is about and where you can find it if you're just listening to money laundering. But I've been thinking about providing the link to the little 10, 15 minute, you know, overview of the topics. Let me know if you think that would be worthwhile. Uh, all the following terms and phrases are associated with the sell side of the option contract except it's like learning a foreign language. So, you know, when you learn the foreign language, you know it. Well, I think of the sell side of the option contract as being the potential victim. You know, they either have an obligation to let somebody call the stock away from them, or they have an obligation to buy the stock. They have an obligation to let somebody put the stock to them. You know, if you didn't want to do that, you shouldn't have collected the premium. So this is as all the following except. So short the contract, yes, sell means short. You pay the premium, no. You know, you receive the premium. If you didn't want to be obligated, you shouldn't have received the premium. You have an obligation, yes, and you receive the premium, yes. So Again, test taking trick B and D are opposites. So even if you didn't know anything about options, it has to be either choice B or D because they're exact opposite things. And then you got to be careful on the accept, right? So we didn't pay the premium, we received the premium. A mutual fund has breakpoints of 25,000, 50,000, 100,000, 250,000. Breakpoints, very testable, are quantity discounts. And, you know, we want to be able to make sure a customer knows how to get the best deal how to get the quantity discount. And, uh, you know, in the quantity discount, you can uh, sign it, very testable letter of intent. If you can't come up with like, for example, 25 grand, that letter of intent's good for 13 months. It can be backdated 90 days. Uh, investment clubs can't, uh, you know, can't form an investment club just to pull purchases to meet a break point. So there's some questions here. Mutual ones are very testable on the SIE and why not learn it? Because get tested once big time on the SIE and then you're going to get tested big time again on your six or seven, whatever top off you're doing. So which of the following transaction might be considered a breakpoint sale? Now, breakpoints are good, but breakpoint sales are bad. They're a violation of the code of conduct. The code of conduct is the ethical behavior that associated persons and broker dealers owe customers. And one thing we do agree not to do is to uh, maximize our commission by avoiding the breakpoint. So it looks like 48,000. Wow, that's pretty damn close to 50. Right. And it looks like that could be potentially a breakpoint sales scenario. So, one, the client uh, redeems. No, it's not about redeeming, it's about buying. So, it's not about redeeming, it's about buying. The client purchases 252000 Well, no, actually, they just met the breakpoint there uh, by $2,000. That's not a problem. The client purchases ninety six. Yeah, that looks pretty close. So, we're looking for one and four. And then make sure you know how I can get you the reduced sales charge, right? With that letter of intent, they're very testable. All the following are considered uh, major credit agencies, except, now this is kind of stupid, 
Um, I would know that the standard and poor's rating triple B is investment grade and less than triple B is less than investment grade. And I would know the bonds have both credit risk and interest rate risk and Fitch's is Moody's is standard poor's is, uh, I don't think there's anything called the U S treasury credit agency. Uh, Craig and Judy have just married. All right. Um, it is their second marriage for both of them. Ooh, <laughs> So this isn't their first rodeo. You know, I was a practitioner. This would be more often what I would see instead of joint tenants with rights or survivorship, uh, tenants in common. But let's see what the question's about. Uh, both of them have kids from a prior marriage. Craig would like his portion of their account to go to his kids. So that right there says it can't be joint tenants with rights or survivorship because if Craig and Judy jo join tenants with rights or survivorship and Craig dies, Judy has 100% of the account. Uh, Judy would like a portion of her kids. So it sounds like they're on the same page here. As uh, new partners in the marriage, while they're both alive, they would like to have full access to the account. Uh, which would you uh, recommend? Uh, this is very much, very much a test question, tenants in common. Uh, you know, make sure you spend some time on customer accounts. Make sure you spend some time on uh, customer accounts. And particularly make sure you can contrast joint tenants with rights or survivorship with joint tenants in common. I mean, the other distinction, by the way, is there is a fractional interest here. It could be 50-50 or whatever. That's not true with joint tenants with rights or survivorship. Uh, fe fe uh, federal, state, and local income tax would be due uh, on the interest from which of the following? So I kind of like this question. I don't like the answer, so, but I like the takeaway. Uh, you should definitely know that Ginny Mae is fully taxable. Ginny Mae is fully taxable. You should definitely know Ginny Mae pays interest and principal monthly. You're buying a proportionate uh, ownership in a pool of mortgages. And you should definitely know that Ginny Mae has the full faith and credit of the United States government. Uh, John and Tara Bone have two children, Henry and Avery, for whom they want to set up a custodial account. Custodial accounts are very testable. I can't imagine you not getting a question on uniform transfer to minor act accounts, custodial accounts, or uniform gift to minors account. And you definitely need to know one minor, one custodian per account. You definitely need to know kids tax ID number goes on the account. And you definitely need to know no margin. So which of the following registrations are allowed? So it looks like they're testing on this idea of one-on-one, -on -one. one custodian, one minor per account. And so John Bourne is custodian for Henry and Avery? No. It was, we said one on one. You can have one, only can have one custodian, one minor per account. There are multiple donors. John Bourne as custodian, custodian for Henry Bourne. By the way, then it would say UTMA, NV, Nevada, or whatever the case may be. Uh, that sounds like the right answer. And that is testable. That is very testable. Uh, GAHI uh, Equity Fund has a public offering price of 30 and a net asset value of 2820. So, you know, the NAV uh, plus the sales charge equals the uh, public offering price. So what I'm gonna do here is figure out what is the sales charge. So I'm gonna take 30 uh, minus 2820 and I get a dollar 80. So that's the sales charge. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the dollar 80 and I'm going to divide by the public offering price, which is 30. And that will give me the percentage sales charge. So uh, let me just get on my calculator here. Uh, $1.80 divide by 30. And I get 6%. Uh, I don't think you're going to have to do that on the test, to be honest with you. The math I would be prepared for to do on the test is uh, not the 6%, but rather... Make sure you can do current yield and make sure you can do tax-free and taxably equivalent yields. The primary use of a revocable living trust. So revocable, you know, means that you can make changes to it. That's what the word revocable means. There's a lot of fancy words in the uh, securities industry, right? And I wouldn't worry too much about trust. If you go come on, uh, come back and you're taking a 65, 66, it becomes a bigger deal. All right. So um, limit the grantor access to items in the estate. The grantor is the person 
who sets this up and no, the, you know, the whole point here is the grantor still has control of the assets. I wouldn't worry about this again. Uh, yeah, as a substitute of a will, I mean, the point here is to have a trust so you don't need a uh, will. So that is true. You know, the grantor is pretty much in control until they, you know, pass on. And again, I wouldn't worry about that question at all on your exam. Uh, state registration is not required if the transaction's exempt. An example of a exempt transaction would be, now, these are called blue sky laws. And as an investor, a retail investor, keyword retail investor in my state, I have a state administrator who protects me. And one of the things the Uniform Securities Act says, which is the template everybody uses, is that uh, you know uh, there are certain exempt registrations and transactions that don't need to be registered with the uh, uh, state administrator. A uh, government bonds is not an exempt transaction. That's an exempt security. One that is solicited is certainly not exempt. That's broker calling you trying to sell you something. One that is unsolicited, yeah. And then muni bonds are again exempt securities. Uh, again, I wouldn't worry this. I would have maybe you're going to get one question on the state uh, blue sky laws. And what you need to know is that under, you know, whatever blue sky you're under, the rules change, right? That's why, well, leaving California, welcome to Nevada, and have a general understanding of that, that state regulatory framework, which requires the registration of broker dealers and their agents, investment advisors, and their investment advisor reps in the security, unless there's some kind of exclusion or exemption. Again, do not overdose this on this on the SIE. Uh, but other exams, it gets a little more, more complicated. An investor has asked a mutual fund for a copy of the statement of additional information. I think we did this, didn't we uh, do this one, similar, similar one to this one already? I think we did. Anyways, remember, that's the additional information that, that we tell you in the prospectus that there is additional information upon request. And so now that the customer has uh, made that request, and as we said, it's three business days from the date of the request. Again, I think low, low probability on the SAE. Uh, which of the following is considered the most volatile benchmark in interest rates? This answer set is very testable. You should know every one of these. You should know. It's not A, but A, the prime rate is what banks charge their best commercial customers. That is testable. I'm telling you that every one of these answers could have been correct. A, it's not correct. Broker call is what banks charge brokerage firms for money. And that is used test question to find out finance margin accounts. The debt balance is what you owe your brokerage firm. And so brokerage firm charge you broker call plus. The discount rate is set directly by the Fed, and that's from Fed to member banks. And the Fed funds rate is the most volatile. That's banks with excess reserves, lending the banks with uh, deficient reserves. Most volatile just means it changes the most often. So the answer there is D. By the way, that answer set is very testable. Uh, the minimum... Uh, requirement when purchasing 100 shares of 12 a new account this is stupid but testable i have an entire lecture on this because it's so stupid it is so testable so the minimum is two thousand dollars but why would you want to give me two hundred thousand dollars to buy twelve hundred dollars worth of stock so you're just going to pay in full so less than two thousand you pay in full between two thousand and four thousand you pay two thousand stupid but testable each of the following activities would require prior written notification by an associated person except. So again, I call these the Sesame Street uh, questions. You know, one of these things is not like the other. And so we're going to go through the answers that looking for which one of these things seems to be different. Um, associated person except. Now, remember, the rule is about making a uh, written notification if you're doing something for pay. So A, part-time work, working for cars, yeah, that's for pay. And remember, the, your broker-dealer can restrict that. So yes, that's you working for money, and we want to make sure there's no adverse interest. Uh, B, acting as a real estate sales agent, limited to the sales of individual homes only. It doesn't have to do with its real estate. If you're a sales agent, you have an outside business activity. So A is an outside business activity. B is an outside business activity. You invest in an oil and gas drilling program. You're a limited partner. That is not an outside business activity. That is a passive investment, right? C, offering to sell limited partnerships. No, that's called selling away. You know, if you're doing that, that should be done through the, you know, through your broker dealer. And if not, get your broker dealer's permission to do so. So the answer is C. Uh, by the way, C, it would be C too if it said investing in a mutual fund because both being a limited partner 
in the partnership or being a shareholder of a mutual fund or passive investments. Uh, which of the following securities would most likely have the lowest expense ratio? Well, you should have been able to get this through process of elimination. You should know that a non-qualified variable annuity, that's a mutual fund with an insurance wrapper. So you're not only going to be paying for the separate account, the sub account and the fees associated with that, but also that insurance part of the uh, product. So certainly ain't that. Uh, mutual funds. You know, mutual funds have uh, custodians, they have a board, they have an investment advisor. And so, yeah, there's going to be some expenses there. They're buying and selling securities. Uh, exchange traded funds are typically passively managed. Uh, you should be able to contrast ETFs with open end mutual funds. Now, the biggest thing is an open end fund is continually offering new shares to the public, and you can't buy it on margin because you can't buy new issues on margins. It's new issues 30 days from the effective date. Where ETFs can be purchased on margin, you should know open end funds are always doing business based on the next calculation of the NAV called forward pricing. Not true of ETFs, they trade supply and demand in the secondary market. And they're a little more tax efficient because they're not you know, buying and selling securities. Uh, qualified, doesn't matter whether it's qualified or non-qualified, the, the variable and woody product, the, the, what that means qualified is you're using pre-tax money, but they still have a higher expense structure than do ETFs. You should definitely know uh, fiscal policy is government spending and taxation. You should definitely know it's controlled by Congress and the president. You should definitely know that monetary policy is the money supply controlled by the Federal Reserve Board. That is very testable. So it's the most efficient uh, means for solving short-term economic issues. Well, you know, I got to think about that. I mean, you're in an environment where a lot of the stuff that you're getting tested on is pretty current, right? So, you know, this is kind of, I would probably overthink this. So, you know, there's going to be ones where, you know, if we have questions for everybody. I might overthink it. But, you know, I'm kind of thinking, well, okay, I think the government could send out some checks a little quicker than the Federal Reserve Board can do, you know, that the fiscal most efficient means for solving short term. No, you know, I'm going to say no on that because as I'm thinking about it, I just said, okay, well, let's see. The government sends me a check or the Fed raises interest rates. They can meet tomorrow and do that, right? So I think the Fed can act a little quicker than can Congress. It's not considered, well, by the way, 50 50, right? I either got to take one or two. It's not considered the most efficient means to solve short term economic issues. You know, uh, we have what are called exigent events. And when there's exigent events, that's a fancy word for if there's an emergency, the Fed can do whatever it needs to do, right? So uh, two is true, two is true. It's reflected in the budget, def uh, budget decisions by our president and Congress. That's definitely testable. You should definitely know that. So you should have been able to know three and you should have been able to eliminate four. So if you say I'm taking three, and I'm not taking four, then it gives you a better chance. But here it's going to be two and three. I don't think it'll be as obtuse on your SIE, but you're definitely going to get five, six economic questions. So make sure you, well, maybe five, six will have you, but you're going to get them. So make sure you're prepared. An investor owns a bond carrying a 4% coupon. Interest rates in the marketplace have been moving downward. All right. So I'm getting four and new ones only pay two and a half. Woohoo. If I were going to sell you my 4% bond, I'd say, hey, brand new ones only pay two and a half. Mine pays four. So if I'm going to sell it to you, I will want a higher price. Very testable. When interest rates go down, the bond price goes up. That's an inverse relationship. Anybody ask, ever ask you about economics, finance, or investments, you want to sound smart, say it has a lot to do with interest rates. If they say, what about them? You say they fluctuate. They say, is that good news or bad news? You say, it depends, right? It depends. All the following are market centers with the secondary market except. So exchanges, yes, the New York Stock Exchange test question is an auction order driven market. What they're doing is matching buyers and sellers. And indeed, remember, secondary market means the issuer is receiving the proceeds. So B is certainly what? The third market is listed securities traded over the counter. So Twitter is a New York Stock Exchange stock. So any trade in Twitter that doesn't take place on New York, but takes place elsewhere is called a third market trade. An over the counter market. Yeah, I just third markets over the counter. NASDAQ is over the counter. Over the counter markets, test question, can best be characterized as negotiated quote driven markets where there are dealers called market makers 
who post their bid and their ask and trade from inventory. So by process of elimination, I'm going to say A. Uh, I would also know the fourth market. The fourth market is to trading direct trading between institutions. Uh, direct trading between institutions. Which of the following investment companies does not redeem its shares? This is very testable. Remember, we said closed-in funds trade supply and demand. So you don't redeem. You just sell it to someone else for more than or less than you originally paid. That's very testable. Brokers placing own uh, orders for their own account ahead of no notably large customers. So, you know, uh, I know Fidelity is going to be buying the stock. I go, wow, when Fidelity starts to buy, it's probably going to go up. Uh, in attempt to gain, that's called front running, front running. Uh, I, I wouldn't worry about uh, all the lagging, coincident, and leading indicators. And You know, what we're trying to figure out when we're talking about these indicators, where are we at in the business cycle? You know, leading indicators tell us where we're heading. And the only leading indicator I'd be worried about on the test is the stock market. The stock market is all about earnings or future expectations of earnings. And I wouldn't worry about coincident or lagging. I would definitely know GDP, gross domestic product, is the total goods and services an economy produces. I would definitely know that two calendar quarters of declining GDP is the definition of a recession. And I would know six calendar quarters of declining GDP is a depression. This is a coincident indicator and I wouldn't worry about uh, the laundry list of these indicators. I would have a you know, fly high here is what I'm saying, but everything I just told you is testable. Uh, I know you're not surprised. I have an economics lecture. I also have an explication of the FINRA content outline for you. So check it out. I, I like my title. It's called Money is a Giant Floating Crap Game, <laughs> which is a quote from Lord John Merrick Gaines. Uh, regarding open-end and closed-end funds, all the following are true. Again, I don't even know what this question is yet, but I can tell you I like it because they're going to torment you on the difference between open-end and closed-end funds. So in one of my lectures, I have a slide and it's the most target-rich slide I think I have on the entire YouTube channel. And it just goes through and it tells you what you, know, you need to know about the distinction between open-end and closed-end funds. So uh, find that little video. That video is worth some, uh, some points. Uh, I think the thumbnail is open and closed. So it should be pretty easy to find. Uh, like I say in the comment box, I, I don't want to start putting too many links in the thing. Uh, trying it's, it's harder than it probably you probably think to keep the channel as much as I can organize. So I'm not so sure what's easier to to link in the video description and tell you right now I'm not doing that. Or you know, and, and when I make future videos, say you can find that lecture and, and tell you in the timestamp it's in 50 more four minutes in, or just you know make you go find it. You know, based on the channel, uh, the challenge there is that, you know, there's almost 200 videos. So again, I appreciate your comments and let me know what you think the best way to proceed when I, when Dean is doing these, if this isn't your first one joining me and I say, Oh, I have a video on that. <laughs> you know, do you want me to tell you where the video is at or link it? <laughs> right. So anyways, uh, both offer unlimited number of shares in a continuous public offering. All of them are true, except that is not true. Right. You know, the, Closed-in fund does a one-time initial public offering and then trades supply and demand. So that is not true. So I'm looking for something that's false. And it looks like that's my best answer. Now, before I do this, I want to make sure I read the full answer. Both offers numerous investment objectives to select from. That's true. You could get an open or closed fund for doing whatever. Uh, both may avoid taxation by distributing their net investment income. In fact, the minimum would be 90%. I would know that, die 90 the dividends on the stock in the portfolio plus the interest on the bonds in the portfolio, less expenses, they must pass through at 90. But if they pass it all through, then there's no worries. Net investment income, by the way, is die 90. Uh, they can be diversified or non-diversified. Yeah, looks like A is our best answer there. Uh, your customer purchased 100 shares of common stock at 75. Remember, that's called cost basis. So that's my cost basis. I sell it uh, on January 17th. I sell the shares for 80 on February 2nd. So it looks like I have indeed been at risk for more than a year. And I've been at risk for more than a year. That is a long-term capital gain. So I have 100 shares here. 
I'm just checking this Kaplan or Substeers. I'm just making sure there's no leap year involved or, you know, so it looks like $5 on a hundred shares that I've had that been at risk for more than a year is going to be a $500 long-term gain. By the way, that's called my sales proceeds. So my cost basis was $75 a share or 7,500. My sales proceeds are 80 or $8,000. The difference between my sales proceeds and my cost basis is the $500. An investor purchases a bond at par. The bond has a coupon rate of, uh, I would use the teeter-totter here. And when you buy a bond at par, all the yields are the same. The nominal yield, also known as the coupon fixed or stated rate of return. Uh, my lecture is called James Bond, not uh, Ford Bond, not James Bond. That's an entire bond lecture, but there's a carve out just on the teeter-totter or seesaw, how we use to answer this. And all the yields are going to be the same. When you buy a bond at par, the current yield, the yield to maturity, yield to call are all the same. In a proxy contest, which of the following must register uh, with the SEC? So in a proxy contest, proxy means voting, a voting contest. So, you know, and you don't have to attend the meeting to vote and you can give a third party, uh, you know, the, the ability to vote your shares if you'd like. And so that's what this question is about. You know, it's got securities industry essentials, like learning a foreign language. So, you know, they say when you dream the foreign language, that's when you know it. So I guess when you have your first, you know, uh, SIE dream. Uh, uh, let's see. So in a proxy, I law, all shareholders have been approached by solicitors. So you as a shareholder don't have to register with the SEC. Uh, persons who are participating in proxy solicitation. So this is a, a third party that's been hired to try and get you to vote in favor or against a certain proposition. And they definitely need to uh, register with the SEC. The upper management, who are going to tell you what they think you should do in terms of the contest, what you should vote in favor or against. Uh, no, they don't have to register. All uh, persons providing uh, shareholders with unsolicited advice. Uh, it's going to be two and four. Uh, I wouldn't worry about this, but, you know, in, in terms of your SIE, what I would worry about is knowing that, you know, uh, you don't have to attend shareholder meetings to vote. You can vote by proxy. Your proxy materials have to be forwarded to shareholders at no charge to you. So regardless of whether your uh, securities are in street name of your broker dealer or not, you know, you're going to get those forward. Um, you know, and then, you know, I'd have a general understanding of corporate actions, you know, whether it's a tender offer or an acquisition or, you know, things that shareholders vote on board seats, all that kind of stuff. Uh, which of the following uh, pairs of option contracts is not in the money if the strike price is 40 and the market price is 30? So I have two great memory aid devices for you. Call up, put down. Call up, put down. Call up. If the market price is up from the strike price, calls are in the money. Put down, put down. If the market price is down from the strike price, it's in the money, has intrinsic value. By the way, in the money and intrinsic value are the same things. And I got to be careful here. Boy, Kaplan, not in the money, not in the money. So if the market price is 30 and the strike price is 40, a uh, long call at 40 or short call, you could use either one, with a stock at 30 is not in the money. So I need long call. Uh, that's helpful because now I have a 50-50, right? A or C. Now, as I told you, the, it's not about whether you're long or short. It's the relationship of the market price of the stock, 30, to the strike price of the option. So it doesn't matter whether you're long or short that 40 call. That 40 call is not in the money. It's out of the money. Uh, I think this way more sophisticated option question than you're going to get on your SIE. Uh, boom. The 40, uh, 40 puts with the stock at 30 are going to be in the money. They're going to have intrinsic value. Okay, so I'm just getting my uh, timer going off. I told you I'd like to tell you when there's 30 minutes. So we've now been at it an hour. I'm on question 51, which is about typical of these uh, practice tests that I explicate for you. And, uh, you know, like I say, I know it's long, but you can always hit pause, take a break and come back. And, uh, you know, our practice exams are one of our uh, most popular pieces of content on the channel. So that's why I, I do them, even though I know I'm asking you to invest uh, 90 minutes of your time. So hopefully the 90 minutes you're investing in these uh, practice ex explications 
are helpful and find you some points. All right, which of the following, I've reset the egg timer. Let's see if we can bring this in in 90 minutes. Which of the following would constitute improper use of a customer's securities or funds? Uh, agreeing to a stock purchase, the representative thinks is beyond the client's means. So improper use. I, I, well, I'm not looking for something like that. What I'm looking about when I see improper use, I'm thinking about like commingling or fraudulent conversion where I'm turning your assets into mine. You know, that's kind of what I'm thinking about. Let's see, you know, what my choices are. So I don't think A is, you know, one, excuse me, is what I'm looking for here. Selling a bond at a client's insistence during a period of high interest rates. Well, no. I mean, we have to follow my customer's instructions. So I can certainly eliminate that. By eliminating two, let's see if that's helpful in the answer set. Uh, so now I have a 50-50. I'm just looking at my answer set here. And if I eliminate two, that means I'm getting rid of choice A and I'm getting rid of uh, choice D. And that means three is going to be a part of my answer set because that's in, in any question. Lending securities for a short sale when the client has uh, agreed to it on the phone. Uh, this is Kaplan being kind of a jerk, but what they're testing on here is the loan consent form. Loan consent form, when you open a margin account, one of the forms that's not mandatory is for me to say, hey, we have other customers who wish to sell short securities. Would it be okay to lend them your securities? And you say, well, Dean, I don't think it's in my best interest to do that. I said, well, it's not. And that's why it's not mandatory. So that's going to be a problem. Uh, lending securities for short sale when the client has agreed to it over the phone. I think that's going to be improper use, right? Because I need I need to have that written form. So barring a customer's without permission, yeah, that's called stealing. <laughs> so that was the one I was looking for, by the way, right? So three and four. When XYZ is trading at 40 and XYZ 30 put, well, remember here, uh, you purchase it. So that's a choice to sell at 30. And the problem right now with a choice to sell at 30 with the stock at 40, that makes no economic sense. And so your contract right now is out of the money. Your break even, remember, would be put down, call up, put down would be 30 minus 327. Uh, at the money, by the way, it would be when the uh, XYZ is at 30 and parity would be when there's no time value in the contract again. I'm not so sure how much time you want to spend on options to pass the SIE. Uh, in this draw, you know, we get, I'm wishing for you a dream draw when you take the actual test. The dream draw is everything you studied shows up and you go, woo. Um, this draw that we're doing here from the Kaplan Q Bank, uh, shout out to Kaplan, uh, is I think not uh, reflective in terms of the option questions. What I mean by that is we're getting some high end option questions. We haven't got any like, when do options expire? When does the uh, disclosure document have to be given to you? When do we need the option agreement back? I mean, those are all very testable in their recognition. And the, the majority of the SIE is recognition. You know, three styles of questions are recognition, uh, practical application, you know, concurrent yield, three, four, two stocks, let make you do something, and then judgment. And you don't get many judgment questions at all. So, and this has a few more of those than I think you would expect to see. A uh, customer owns a thousand shares uh, subject to a one for uh, three reverse split. So that means I'm going to have less shares at a higher price. Uh, this is very embarrassing. This is the issue we're trying to get their stock price up. Uh, the position will now consist of fewer shares with less per share. And I just told you the reason we do it is to get the share price up. So for your shares worth more. Yeah, this was embarrassing. Uh, GE did a 10 for one reverse. And the reason for doing the 10 for one reverse was to get the GE stock from a buck to $10. Now there's been no cha effective change in your position and there's no effective change in your proportion and ownership. It's B. Uh, by the way, had it been a forward split, you would have more shares with a lower price. I would also know that stock splits are not a taxable event. You just have to adjust your cost basis per share. Uh, what does the bid represent? So, you know, uh, I have a whole lecture in there saying, know your bid from your ask. The bid is the price at which a market maker is willing to buy securities in the inventory. It's the price at which the customer would sell. So the highest amount that someone can sell the security. Yeah, you know, so if you want to sell the security and you say, Dean, what's the bid? You know, there'll be various market makers. The highest amount someone may buy, that would be the ask. The lowest amount someone can sell the stock at the lowest amount. So 
Uh, I would have a general understanding of the bid and the ask, and the grammar can be uh, kind of atrocious. They're actually going to show you a market maker's quote, and then based on the market maker's quote, ask you kind of very much this question, right? So it's the highest amount a customer can sell. So the broker, the market maker buys, the customer sells. All right, you're going to get, that is a test question. Uh, 34, they were companion pieces of legislation. So boom. Uh, 33 was the prospectus or paper act. You're getting questions right, but covering up your screen. Are they asking about paper prospectuses or are they asking about people and places? If they're asking about prospectuses and papers, it's 33. If they're asking about people and places, it's 34. And indeed, it created the SEC, the commission. The SEC is God, right? The SEC has primary jurisdiction, interpretation, and enforcement of the domestic securities laws of the United States of America. Uh, by the way, you should definitely know FINRA. FINRA is the self-regulatory organization. You should definitely know the MSRB, the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board that published rules. The big one to know is that G37, 250 bucks. And you should know about the state administrator. A firm designated as self-clearing. So to clear a trade, you need an order department to uh, transmit the order to the appropriate market center. You need a purchase and sales department to generate the confirmations and match the trades. You need a margin department to determine whether monies or securities are due. And you need a cash sharing department to do uh, take receipt of monies and securities. And a lot of us don't do that. Some of us uh, use a clearing firm to do our back office for us. So a firm designated self-clearing can act in a back office capacity for an introducing firm. Indeed. You know, what that means in English is, uh, you know, my firm was called Gamma Global. So when you get my statement, it says Gamma Global Investments uh, is introduced to national financial. So I'm telling you that Gamma Global isn't holding your monies and securities. National financial is. I used to use that as part of my presentation. I used to say, listen, I can't steal what I don't touch. And I don't have any of your stuff. I don't have an order department. I don't have a PNS department. I don't have a margin department. I don't have a cashiering department. National Financial does, or Pershing. Those are what we call clearing firms. So that's true. Uh, not act in the back office, no. I mean, you know, you don't have to. Some firms offer their clearing services and some firms do not. Uh, clear and settle trades for other firms. Indeed, that's exactly what clearing uh, firms uh, do. Only clear transactions it executed. No, they're clearing trades for all of their, they're called correspondence. Correspondence are the clearing firms, uh, you know, customers that they're doing this for. So one and three. I kind of got into it with Kaplan a little bit about the definition of stuff. And, and then, you know, we decided it wasn't worth it because it's the tit for tat. Because, you know, nobody gets asked the question anyways. And, you know, I, I didn't like their description of what a prime broker does. Anyways, customer called you and stated they are interested in purchasing a large company growth mutual fund. After some discussion, you recommend they invest in the ABC growth fund. So this is a suitability question. And suitability questions are judgment questions. Remember, those are those tough ones. This is an example of which of the following. Well, it's not unsolicited because you're the one who came up with the idea. Uh, it's definitely solicited, a, uh, but not a recommendation. I, mean, I think we're overthinking this. I mean, you know, why would you not want to say, you know, the thing here is you're not supposed to miss mark positions or tick order tickets, I should say. And so I said, well, why are you, you know, struggling with whether this is something you recommended or not? Because, you know, that's kind of a red flag. Uh, I think it, it, this is pretty straightforward. A recommendation is solicited, right? With solicited, because it's my idea, but not a recommendation. Ooh, I almost hit the, I said the right thing and put, picked the wrong button. Eww. A recommendation. There we go. Uh, I had somebody the other day, so, you know, that we say the right thing and then we pick the wrong button. How bad is that, right? A recommendation solicited. It's your recommendation, you solicit it. A person may not act as a registered rep or a principal unless FINRA, remember that's the self-regulatory organization, uh, standards regarding training, experience, and competence are met. And all the following circumstances or instances, statutory disqualification is testable. So any yes answer on your U4 is a problem. But there are some yes answers that are bigger problems than others. We call that in the industry, not testable, a dirty U4. And some of the answers are dirtier than others. So again, I would probably be looking to use here the Sesame Street uh, trick. 
uh, a conviction of a DUI resulting in a fine in probation. Well, statutory disqualifications are going to be, have you been suspended or expelled uh, or revoked registration by another regulator? So that's B, right? And that's C. And making willful misstatements, meaning checking something no one of you before that should have been checked, yes. And the other would be a conviction of a felony within the last 10 years. Uh, given this answer set, we're going to go for A, right? So, you know, we don't know about the DUI felony or not, but given that answer set. Which of the following uh, are the most likely to make monthly or quarterly payments for the life uh, of a customer? I wouldn't worry about fixed annuities, but the neat thing about annuity products is you can turn them into an income stream that you can outlive. So you should have been able to get rid of uh, two and three because you should have known that that's not true. And that would be true of an insurance product. And remember we said a variable annuity is a mutual fund with an insurance wrapper. And then fixed annuities are also uh, products that do that, right? So it's going to be one and four. Uh, I wouldn't worry about the fixed annuity, but I would definitely know a variable annuity, again, is that mutual fund with an insurance wrapper. You're funding it with after-tax dollars. It grows tax deferred. And when you get to 59 and a half, you can annuitize. You can turn it into an income stream that you can't outlive. That's kind of a nifty thing to be able to do. Uh, gift or gratuity is very testable. You know, we want to make sure that employees of firm A are not being compromised by employees of firm B. So the maximum gift or gratuity that an employee of one member firm can give to the employee of another member firm is $100. And so now what we have to decide, are we going to say $100 per year or $100 per individual per year? It's per individual uh, per year. Uh, by the way, you should definitely know it doesn't count normal deductible business activities. It doesn't count reminder advertising. Uh, which of the following sets of FINRA rules focuses on how member violations uh, will be handled? I love this answer set. I love this answer set. This is like that other one we had about prime rate, broker call, discount fed funds. You're definitely going to see this answer set on your SIE. And depending on the question will depend on the appropriate answer. So card of, code of arbitration, no. Code of arbitration would have been correct if they said settle civil disputes. And you should definitely know code of arbitration. Uh, statute of limitations is six years. You should uh, definitely uh, know uh, that the customer has to agree to the process. So not the answer here. Uh, the cop, I think a good way to remember it is the cop, the code of procedure cop. You do bad things, you might hear from the cop. That's called the Department of Enforcement of FINRA. Very testable. The Uniform Practice Code is very testable. And remember, the Uniform Practice Code standardizes trading practices in the secondary market. If you mess, everybody's doing it differently. That's where that X date comes from, right? That's where, you know, the accrued interest comes from. So that could have been the answer. They said, which of the following standardizes trading practices within the secondary market in the securities industry? That would have been the Uniform Practice Code known as the UPC. And then we talked about the conduct rules. Remember, that's the ethical behavior that broker dealers and associated persons owe customers. That's big time test fodder. And that's all that stuff you don't do, like breakpoint sales or selling dividends or front running, you know, all that stuff. Uh, which of the following call option uh, for call options is correct? Uh, the maximum gain and loss are the same for both parties. Oh, my goodness, that would be bad if you said that. Because, you know, option contracts have two parties with opposite expectations. It's a zero-sum game. Maximum gain is the same. Eh. Break-even is the same. Yep, call up. Strike price plus premium. And then the difference is where do you want the stock to be in relationship to that break-even? I told you two great memory aids. If you only remember one thing about options, call up, put down, call up, put down. Uh, two years ago, uh, we sold short Lisa Smith at 50. She bought them back for 55, loser. She sold low and she bought back high, woo. So she's got a $5 loss. Uh, the stock paid a $2.50 dividend. Uh, Kaplan, boy, Kaplan is tough. I think they're trying to make us think that we received the dividend and we did not, right? Because we had to make the, give the dividend to the person we borrowed the stock from. 
So who knows? Maybe Dean is going to miss this, but uh, we didn't get that, keep that dividend. Now, this is where, again, Dean might get in it with Kaplan because who knows? The SIE person at Kaplan may not actually be somebody who understands short sales. Uh, but let's see. I'm going to say we didn't do that. Even if we did receive it, it's going to the person we brought the stock. So I think we're going to lose uh, $5 a share here. Let's see if I miss that one. I might miss that. I don't think so, though. If so, I'm going to dispute it. <laughs> you know? The contact rules per permit specific type of lending arrangements between registered reps and customers. Which of the following arrangement is not uh, permitted? And so, you know, that was going to be handled in our written supervisory procedures. And uh, usually, you know, it would be okay if it's your immediate family or it's somebody you have an existing relationship with. So let's see. A, the customer and the registered rep are both registered with the same firm. So not permitted. That is permitted. The firm's customer is a lending institution. You go through the normal process. So it's a bank and it's a customer and you're going through the normal process. That's fine. Uh, your immediate family members, uh, that is fine. The firm lends customer securities without a consent agreement. I think we talked about that earlier, right? If I'm going to lend securities, uh, I need to have the loan consent form, right? From the customer saying that it's okay to lend their securities to other customers who wish to establish short positions. Raising funds is generally accomplished by corporations, the issuance of stock. In fact, that has to be. Equity always precedes debt. There's no such thing as a corporation that has not issued common stock. So that first time issuance is going to take place. I don't know why Kaplan's calling this the capital market instead of the primary market, but it's not the secondary market. There's no such thing as the funding market. And the currency market is a different thing. So I'm going to go for the capital market. Uh, I think on the test, you'll see that expressed as the primary market, right? And then once it's, they've issued it, then it's going to be trading uh, in NASDAQ or New York, whatever the case may be, assuming it's publicly held. Yeah, an investor notices that a bond purchase several years ago at 95, 95% of par, 950, is now priced at 90. So it's gone down 5% or 5 points. So you bought it for 950, you sold it for 90, you re immediately repurchase it for 90. Now what the IRS thing says is we don't think you were through with that as an investment. If you sell it, take the loss and buy it back. So for you to reestablish this at a lower cost base, you would have to wait at least 30 days. Now, if you don't do it, that's called a wash sale and they're going to disallow the loss. So I would know, again, I wouldn't worry about the, the phraseology here, but I would know that if you sell an investment and take a loss and you have to wait at least 30 days to reestablish that position as a new investment at that new lower cost base. Otherwise it's a wash sale and it's disallowed. Now, these other things are fraudulent devices. You know, uh, I wouldn't worry about them, but, you know, fraudulent devices. A variable annuity is an investment product designed to provide which of the following? A tax-free income source? Eh. Short-term savings vehicle? Eh. Yeah, a supplement to your retirement. So if you've already got all your other retirement stuff figured out and you're still trying to do more, you can take some after-tax money and buy a variable annuity. Who's responsible for meeting the desired returns of a defined contribution plan. I, I don't like the phraseology here, but in a defined contribution plan, you probably know, uh, are familiar with one defined contribution plan known as a 401k. And your employer defines to you what they're gonna contribute. You invest it. You now, usually you get a list of mutual funds and whatever it grows to or falls to, uh, you. I don't like this phraseology, but what they're trying to get at is in a defined contribution plan, the employee assumes the investment risk. And if this was a defined benefit plan, the employer or sponsor assumes the investment risk. An institutional customer, such as a hedge fund, utilizes the services of a broker dealer who provides custody as well as back office. You know, so if I'm a hedge fund, I'm not monogamous about who I trade with. I say, listen, if you have a good idea for me, uh, share it with me and I'll execute through your firm so you can get your commission, your markup or markdown. But Goldman Sachs is my prime broker. I don't want to get eight different sets of statements. So I want you to settle up with my prime broker, uh, Goldman Sachs. All right. So this allows the customer to establish relationships for the executing orders. Uh, by the way, we know hedge funds are organized as private partnerships, private partnerships. And so that means they're sold as private placements. 
And so that means if you're not an accredited investor, you can't become a limited partner in hedge fund, no hedge fund for you. Anyways, uh, that's called a prime, prime account. Uh, so you have left the business. You've left for the business, right? Uh, you don't want to, you know, take advantage of, you know, Fenris thing where you can stay qualified by paying them money and taking other tests. You just say, hey, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. You know, this is Dean when I retired, right? So they have jurisdictional retention for two years. So what that means is if they call me within two years of that U5, I'm supposed to pretend that Fenris still has regulatory authority over me. And after two years, I say, well, listen, you no longer have jurisdictional retention. You have no authority over me any longer. So that's two years. Uh, the allowable deduction. Oh, my goodness. Sometimes Kaplan is, you know, that's a good thing, I guess. I mean, we're trying to stretch your mind. Kaplan doesn't go back to the same spot. I think this is outrageous to ask you about depreciation, uh, you know, in a, you know, oil and gas deal. Uh, I would know that. Uh, depreciation is a non-cash expense. And so a partnership, the flow through of the profits and losses, I would know that. The direct participation program or partnership has a flow through of income and losses. And sometimes the losses are called by depreciation, which is a non-cash expense. We're charging the asset for its use uh, because at the end of the life, useful life, we're going to have to re, uh, replace it. And so that's going to be depreciation. Now, Depletion would be for the oil that we pumped out of there and sold. Uh, I personally think this is outrageous to have this as a practice question on the SIE uh, QBank, but hey, I'm not in charge of the capital in QBank. I, again, sometimes get, people get confused about my relationship. I am a, a former, years ago, years and years ago, uh, senior member of a management team that sold the predecessor company called Dearborn to Kaplan. And when that happened, uh, I then became an independent contractor for Kaplan when I wasn't busy, you know, running Gamma Global or doing other things. And so they hire me as a uh, independent contractor to teach uh, all the different securities exams for them in private classes primarily. I set my own public schedule. I haven't decided. I do an SIE the first month of each quarter. I'm not sure I'm going to do that in 2023. I know the internet's forever. So who knows when you're listening to this? So I may or may not be on the public schedule of Kaplan at that point. Anyways, but, uh, Kaplan is kind enough to give me a discount code, Guru10, and let me use some Kaplan content for my YouTube channel. So, uh, you know, I am a Kaplan fan. Now, the channel itself is agnostic. We help lots of people, training consultants, Path Perfect, you know, STC, you know, Kaplan. In terms of the channel, it doesn't matter what studies, uh, your study source, your primary study source is, or your paid uh, study materials, because this is a free supplement. Anyways, like your customer fails to invest sufficient new money as required under a letter of intent. You know, the customer cannot be a herd. So I, I feel bad if I'm a broker and I can't get you to sign a letter of intent. Yeah, you're not going to be hurt. That's what B is saying. So I say, listen, as a result of paying the lower sales charge, you're going to be able to buy additional fund shares. And whatever additional fund shares you buy, we're going to put them in an escrow account. And if you don't fulfill it, we're just going to liquidate those, uh, those shares and your account will look exactly like it would have looked had you not done this. There is no way you can be heard by filling out a letter of intent. So, you know, that's why if there's any doubt the customer uh, should fill out. The way we say that in a legal sense is it's a unilateral contract. It's only binding on the, uh, the, on the uh, firm. Let's see if I don't have a better answer. The customer may liquidate the escrow shares without a penalty. Well, no. Uh, now that I'm reading that, I don't like it because we're going to back flag your account, as I just mentioned. Uh, the customer has to deposit to cover the difference or lose the escrow shares. There we go. But remember, that does, that's not really a penalty because it's going to look like it would have looked had you not done it, right? So, uh, you know, uh, again, I would definitely have a handle on breakpoints and are good and breakpoint sales are bad and LOIs and, you know, that kind of thing. I don't think this would be the phraseology but I would have the idea that it's a good idea to do this because you can't be hurt. Call up, put down, call up, put down. First thing I would tell you is there's no such thing as negative intrinsic value. So you could toss out A and B. It's either out of the money. There's no such thing as negative. Call up. If the market price is up from the strike price, the contract has intrinsic value. It's in the money. Call up. The break even is 30 plus three. 33. 
this is very foolish because you sold it. And I mean, you're obligated to sell the stock at 30 and you're exposed to unlimited risk. Uh, here, they're just asking, what is the intrinsic value? The premium's there to mess you up. All we're looking at is the relationship of the strike price, 30, to the market price of the stock, 40, call up. It's 10. Uh, by the way, that's really bad because you sold it for three and now it's 10. And so if you went to do your closing purchase, you did an opening sale at three, if you did a closing purchase, it would cost you at least $10 because you at least because there's going to be time value as well. So this is not looking look good, right? And it can continue to get worse. But the answer is 10. The intrinsic value in the money is just the relationship of the strike price to the market price. Uh, your customer notes that the amount of commission they paid for your broker dealer for their purchase of 100 shares is about 1% of the purchase price. Uh, on this trade, your firm acted in what capacity? So commission A, B, C, agent, broker, commission, agent, broker, commission. So when we hear the word commission, we know the capacity was that ever as an agency broker. We act in our broker agency capacity. We have to disclose that. And so it says on this trade, acted in the amount of commission. That's the key word, commission. If it was a markup or markdown, then the answer would have been D, market maker or on the confirm principal basis. So C. All right, looks like we're gonna get this done in 90 minutes. When a bond is purchased at a premium, the teeter-totter or seesaw is uh, very good for this. This isn't a lecture, it's an explication. But uh, you know, if you're good at your teeter-totter, if you're not, that's part of doing these, you probably should get better at it. There's that. And we're buying the bond at a premium. Boom. And the fulcrum is the nominal yield. And so it says the current yield will be the same as, no, that's a bond at par, uh, lower than the coupon rate. That's indeed true based on my teeter-totter. Now, if that doesn't look familiar to you, I would send you to the discussion uh, of that. So it's going to be lower than the coupon rate. Boom. The coupon rate is the same, by the way, as the nominal yield, the fixed or stated rate of return. All those mean the same thing. So again, it's like learning a foreign language. All right, so let's see how we did. Uh, boom, submit. Uh, not answered. Okay, well, let's go back there. I'll tell you what, I'm just going to take the hit for not answering 49. The reason I'm going to take the hit on 49, I probably said what the answer was and didn't hit the button. I've done the past, but I'm not as familiar as, uh, as you are probably are with the Kaplan Q Bank. And one time I did this and it kind of tossed me out and I wasn't able to you know, figure out what it, where it was. So I'm going to take the hit on 49 and whatever else I missed rather than circle back. So let's just submit it. Okay, so it says I missed, uh, what I miss here? I missed two. So let's go see what uh, we missed. Uh, what did I say? I said structuring. Eh, I don't like that. Let's see. Um, I would have filed the SAR. So it appears the customer is structuring deposits to avoid, and I call that suspicious. This activity is called structuring. It's true because I'm trying to avoid triggering the CTR. Yeah, okay. But, you know, to me, the, the structuring is, is the red flag. It's not the CTR. So I, I kind of disagree with that one, but oh, well, it would make a difference on, on your test. I said it's structuring and it's suspicious. It's commercially illogical. The question is, says, we should have followed the CTR and we're trying to avoid it. And again, we're just, it's a judgment question. What I tell you about judgment questions, that's how they go, right? Uh, let's see, what's our next one we missed? That was 26. 49, I think I just didn't answer. Let's see what I said here. Uh, oh, man, how did we miss that? I must have I just pushed past it. Uh, remember, this is uh, FINRA's uh, MSRB rule called pay to play. Pay to play is, you know, when I try and compromise a, a political, you know, an issue or municipality to uh, get underwriting business. Uh, this is very testable. You should know it's 250 bucks. Uh, anyways, a municipal security has just made a contribution to the mayor's reelection campaign. I have to be able to vote. How long must the firm uh, wait to enter competitive bids? Well, it's not about competitive bids. It's about negotiated bids. So there's no waiting period there. Oh, I can't answer it now. Oh, well. I'll take the hit, but definitely make sure you know that. Um, I don't think you're going to see it expressed this way. It would be a two-year prohibition 
if it was for negotiated transactions, I wouldn't worry. Make sure you know it's the $250 per election cycle and that the municipal financial professional has to be able to vote. Has to be able to vote. Okay, let's see. Was that it? Let's see. Okay, so uh, hope you found that helpful. Remember, inch by inch, the SIE is a cinch, yard by yard. The SIE is hard. We have a pretty full SIE playlist. So I brought down, I'll be circling back anytime soon to add more into the SIE playlist. But if you have any recommendations or requests, send them my way. And I'm more than happy uh, to add them into the playlist, make a little video and put them in there. Uh, talk to you later. Bye-bye.